14. Kamokwahina. To be divided. Living with Boki was like living with a Kona wind. One day he'd allow me to sleep in the middle of the day. The next, he'd work me with no rest. But he kept me supplied with clothing and made sure I looked presentable at all times. If my hair grew too long he'd pull out scissors and order me to sit on his porch for a haircut. You're starting to look like an outcast, he'd growl. One day, in the year after the Siloma people built their church, he talked about his mother while he cut my hair. The Board of Health is killing her, he declared. She was strong as Koa would before they sent me here. And now she is tender like a blade of new marsh grass. I thought about my mother and how she had not slept for worrying about me. Was it possible that Boki also had a mother who cared for him? I tried to imagine him as a child. But I just couldn't. And I couldn't imagine Boki thinking of anyone besides himself. He spat over the edge of his porch and said, I refused to present myself at their detention center because my mother needed me. So they forced their way into our house and dragged me out in the middle of the night. She had no time to say a proper aloha and I could not make provisions for her welfare. I thought I saw a tear in Boki's eye. At least she has Father Damien to visit her. Father Damien? I asked. A Catholic priest, said Boki. He has converted my mother to his religion. And he dips often into our poi because she thinks he is part of her ohana. But nearly every family in Kohala has adopted Damien by now. So he's away much of the time. Traveling over the district to care for his flock. I didn't see how a foreign priest could be much like family. Especially a priest who never stayed home. I knew that recently a Catholic missionary named Bertrand had come to Kalawau to build a chapel. But he was like the priest Boki was talking about. He would not stay around for long. Still, Boki had made me curious about his family. What about the rest of your ohana? I asked. The rest of my ohana? Boki waved his scissors in front of my face too close to my nose. Apparently my brother has returned to manage my farm. He provides my mother with plenty of my sweet potatoes. I want her to have them. But a mother cannot live on food alone. She needs her son. And my brother is not her good son. I laughed. You were the good son. Boki leaned down so that he looked full at me with his one good eye. Tell me, he said, if your mother could see you now, would she call you her sweet little boy? I looked away then out to the sea and beyond, toward my beloved Oahu. I was once a good person, I said. Sure you were, said Boki. But who would know it now? His question made me wonder. Did Boki adopt me because he thought I was as bad as he was? I knew I was angry. But that didn't mean I was evil. At least, I didn't think it did. The Board of Health has turned us into scoundrels, said Boki. They should call it the Board of Death. They send us here to die. But we don't die from leprosy. We die because we give up on living. We die from gangrene and consumption, and dampness, and starvation. At home we would be warm and well fed. But the Board of Death prefers this solution. His scissors made threatening sounds close to my ears. Boki snipped and snarled. If they hide us away, visitors from Europe and America will bring money to our islands. If they don't, the travelers will take their money elsewhere. Then how would the government pay for its fine hotel? The fine hotel was the latest news in all the papers our families sent from home. Our government had built it. I wished I could see the grand building, and maybe even catch a glimpse of our king visiting with foreign royalty on the wide porch. But Boki did not wish to see the hotel. He wanted to burn it to the ground. They can't find the money to build huts for their own people in Kalawau, he complained. And yet they can build a three-story hotel to entertain any foreigner with money in his pocket. Boki was working himself into a vile mood. Suddenly he poked me in the back. Why are you loafing in the middle of the day, he demanded. He swatted clumps of hair off my bare shoulders. Go bathe. Fetch us some water, too. The barrel is nearly empty. But first, clean up this mess. He kicked at the hair lying about on the floor. I hurried to do as he commanded. Then I got the buckets and headed toward the stream. It was that time of day when the sun had finally reached the village of Kalawau. And getting away from Boki made it feel even brighter. On the rocky road through the settlement I passed Brother Bertrand, who was on his way to work on the Catholic chapel. One of the Catholic believers had stopped him at her gate. I heard her begging him to stay in Kalawau. But he insisted that it wasn't possible. I'm a brother, he said. 
I cannot perform the duties of a priest. I'll be leaving as soon as the chapel is built. The woman would not give up on the idea of having a priest here. Please, I heard her say as I went past. Please, tell the bishop to send us a father. I had to hurry to the stream, so I did not wait for Bertrand's response. But I knew the woman's plea was useless. No minister would choose to come here if he were not forced to do so. I passed the unfinished chapel with piles of shingles lying in the yard. The roof would soon be completed. Then Bertrand could leave us. Ahead of me, out in the bay, I saw Okola, the small pointed island that poked its head through the deep blue water. I had often imagined swimming out there with Kameka and climbing to its top. We could plate some palm leaves and hang on to them while we leaped out over the bay. The winds would carry us, like birds flying. I closed my eyes and imagined it. If only Kameka were here. But I didn't let myself think about swimming with Kameka. Slowly I was learning to forget him. Soon I wouldn't think of him at all. Before I'd gone very far, I met Aloy with a group of boys returning from the stream. His black hair hung in wet, limp strands on his shoulders. The other children were wet also. I supposed Aloy had ordered them all to bathe in the stream. After they passed me, I heard him say something about touch hands. I knew he was talking about me. Touch hands means thief. He probably felt it was his duty to warn the children about the bad boy who lived with Boki. But they already knew about me. And they feared me, too. I could feel it in the way their chatter turned to silence when I passed them on the trail. As I walked away from them, I thought about the things I'd done to make enemies in this place. It's better this way, I told myself. I don't need friends. From Kameka I had learned not to trust friends. They were like the slippery narrow pass I scrambled through on each trip to get water. Sometimes when the sea was violent, I couldn't go to the stream at all for fear of waves throwing me against the rocks. The pass was friendly today because the sun was shining and the sea was calm. I stepped carefully on the least slippery spots and breathed a sigh of relief when I was safely on solid ground. After a while I came to a place where a forest stream ran into the ocean. I could have collected my water without going farther. Instead I followed the stream up into the wooded valley. I loved these woods for the thick leafy greenness and the happy sound of water running over rocks. I would gladly have gone to get water every day if only Boki would allow it. On this day, I crushed the bulb of a wild ginger plant and used the fragrant sap to lather my hair. After my bath, I dipped Boki's pails into a clear pool. Then I tied my bucket handles to the long pole I'd brought with me and hoisted them onto my shoulders. I turned and began the walk home. When I was almost back to the settlement, I saw Kiona and Makanui coming toward me. Seeing the two of them always softened the hard place inside me. If it weren't for them, I really would believe that enemies were better than friends. Makanui carried her dented water bucket. The job was easy now because the pail was empty. But after she got her water much of it would slosh out along the way. Kiona would not be able to help her because of her crutches. Even on a good day like this, the pass would be difficult for both of them. Stop, I said. I set my buckets on the ground and rubbed at my aching shoulders. It's too far to walk. Take some of my water. I took the bucket from Makanui's hand and half filled it with water. Kiona gasped. Sing praises to the Lord, she breathed. Will Boki beat you? Makanui asked. I wondered the same thing but did not admit it. Oh, no, I said. I'll tell him a thirsty shark stopped me on the trail and drank some of my water. Even Boki is afraid of sharks. Makanui laughed and wagged her head. Then she began to chant. Boki's afraid of sharks. Boki's afraid of sharks. I grabbed her hands and we danced in a circle, chanting it together. We twirled faster and faster until Makanui's long, dark hair stood out behind her. And finally we collapsed on the grass and gulped big breaths of air. Kiona laughed. Pia, it's good that you still have a soft place inside of you. Too much anger will kill you faster than any sickness. I didn't want Kiona or anyone else to tell me I shouldn't feel angry. So I said, I have to go now. Boki will become meaner than a thirsty shark if I'm late. I picked up my buckets and walked toward Kala Wow. I stopped only for a moment to stare at Brother Bertrand working on the new church. He'd chosen to build the chapel close to the only tree in the village, the young hala I'd noticed on my first day in this place. It offered very little shade, but some of the villagers sat beneath it to watch the missionary and those who helped him. Others sat on black boulders or sprawled on the grass. They were pleased to have another church in Kala Wow. Two churches in this place, said a woman. 
Imagine that. It was the same woman who'd been begging for a priest when I passed her house on the way to get water. She must have followed Bertrand here to see his progress. Yes, I said. The Protestants have a church, so I guess the Catholics had to have one too. But no minister for either one, I reminded her. They come for short visits. They say their prayers and leave again. The rest of the time, this new church will be closed. I suppose Bertrand heard me complaining because he called out to me from the roof where he was working. Then he scrambled over the side and climbed down his ladder. I tried to hurry away before he could speak to me. But I only managed to spill water from Boki's buckets. I slowed down and soon I heard a voice in my ear. You must come to the chapel when it's finished. It will be a place for you and the others to receive the sacraments. I stopped and looked at the missionary. Sacraments? I asked. What your people need here is a place to sleep. Will your church be open when the next Kona wind comes through? And where will you be then? Warm and dry in Honolulu. I didn't wait to hear what he had to say. I just hurried away with my buckets of water. Bertrand was probably praying for my soul. He would never guess what I was like before coming to this place. But what did I care what some Catholic priest thought of me? I was a Protestant. Or I had been, anyway. By now, I was no kind of Christian at all.